musicians often reinvent themselves. Only the great ones do it. I think Madonna used to do it a lot for a long time. I would see her reinvent herself. Uh, Beyonce does it. Um, great artists do it. Michael do it. Janet did it. And in terms of what you do, uh, hip hop, they always try to put us in a box. I say us as if I'm a hip hop. And I, I, but you know what I mean? Like they try to put us in a box and we're seeing more mainstream. So a coach called me after you performed, um, for golden state and said, I remember he'd been in the league 30 years. He's like, I remember a time when that would have never happened. And it was beautiful to see. Did you understand the monumental moment for you? Um, yeah, because, you know, I've, I've been a sports fan my whole life. And as, as a sports fan, you know firsthand from being in the arena or the stadium, watching TV, there's not a smidgen of hip-hop in those 80s and 90s that was just seeping through. It just wasn't there. And um, it was amongst all of the players, football and basketball mainly, in that culture. They brought it to work with them. They put their headphones on. They worked out to it. But the, the the powers that be would not allow the music to come in. But, you know, the other side of that is now a lot of the teams, at least the ones that I'm affiliated with, have entertainment departments that are reaching out to hip-hop artists. And they are uh, making sure that the dancers, uh, you know, hip-hop is a part of it. It's the, it's the hottest thing. You got to do it. The songs are playing in the stadium, even the cutaway songs are now, they're giving like up and coming producers like action that you're sitting there watching the playoffs yeah. and your beat comes on. You're like, that's my beat. And it's like, it's a lot of that going on. So I feel it. It would have been dope if that soundtrack was in the background when Alan Iverson was playing. Would have been we, dope you know if it was supposed too? to be. Now that corporate mainstream, whatever, as they, they always do adopt the culture, the hip hop culture, because that's where it starts. They're using it more in documentaries, right? Um, we saw, we saw how the, at the Super Bowl, for instance, that performance got a lot of pushback, but it was such a celebration of hip hop. What was your take on it, just from a performance standpoint? Well, I mean, it was genius. The 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 set was genius to maximize each artist and capture the essence of Dr. Dre all at the same time to, to be a part of, you know, the hometown guy is performing in front of the hometown crowd. The, the almost never happened home team plays in the Super Bowl in their stadium. Mm -hmm. That only happened twice that I know. Yeah, of. Tampa. The, mm -hmm. the time before that was the year before that. So um, it was just all amazing. I, I, I really think mm -hmm. that, you know, Dre thought it out. Dre's a perfectionist. So, you know, but, you know, you look at it like this. You you could say, man, they're finally catching on. You could say that. But you could also say, we're so relentless that you shut the door on us for so many years, so many times, and we're still coming. And the, the genre is still growing. And you, you just, like, hip-hop is the reason why hip-hop is on the platforms now. Not because the platforms got wise. It's because hip-hop just keeps growing. So we forced it on them when they should have got onto it, when they should have used hip hop in mainstream advertising, marketing, whatever they, whatever. They should have been doing it in the nineties. Yes, definitely the early, definitely the early two thousands. To now, just now get on. This is a whole kind of different version of hip hop. You yes. missed a whole other love that millions of people love. You missed all of that. Tribe Called Quest and, and, you know, things from the Midwest and the East. Like, you missed a whole thing. And now this, this is a whole new hip hop. It's fun. It's, it's you know, but I it's never, still, it's love. I never thought but I would have to explain love for the genre. who Tribe Called Quest is or who, to me, it's just like, if you are an artist, and any, a hip hop artist specifically, you should know the greats. You should know Too Short. You should know E-40. You should know. I mean, it's interesting that you said it's two different forms of hip hop. What was it? prior to and when do you see and when did you see it changing as it as it has evolved it's it's i say it's two different form two different kind of hip hop universes because of the generations and there's a um if you say well, I grew up on two shorty 40 you know 90s all that stuff there's a hip hop before that too it was a whole 80s vibe 
that before we reached our so-called golden era of hip hop, the late eighties on into the nineties, uh, there was a whole nother world of hip hop that had a whole different vibe. It was a whole, you know, the, the five boroughs in New York and the break dancing and, you know, the DJs and the spray paint cans and, and battles. Yeah, but and do you think it's changed? You that do you think that the essence so, of what it began isn't still that same essence? For one, it's evolving as it should. And for two, it's growing. It grows. Each time the next the next batch of rappers gets more money. The guys before me, I came in in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. The guys before me did not tour arenas and have platinum albums. Run DMC, LL Cool J, they kicked that door open. And Public Enemy, Tribe Called Quest, Too Short, that era, Boogie Down Productions, E-40, we all, you know, uh, NWA, we all benefited off the Run DMC, LL Cool J door opening up, uh, you know, Run DMC showing you that we have millions of fans. And then, you know, guys like Steve Stout going into corporate America and saying, you better use these guys to sell some products. But it's been a long, hard fight. Now, you could you could um, get popular and the companies will come looking for you to be there, endorse their products. But they didn't want to have anything to do with us. We were we were like limited to like correct, correct. Malt, if liquor, you just beer said, and you said Run the DMC opened the door, Run DMC, L Cool J, Kumo D opened the door for you. Who did who did Too Short and E Forty open the door for? I mean, literally the entire Bay Area independent music scene. That independent spirit is funny because where I got it from was was it came from necessity. And E40 E40 got it from the same place not very shortly after me. Like we we're from the Bay. If you wanted to find a company, a music company, an entertainment company that would pay attention to you and then invest in you, you had to go to Los Angeles or to New York. That's the only place those companies were at. So out of necessity, E-40, in his own world, he didn't call me and, and ask me how to do it. He he had the same desire to be heard and, and to, to make money off his music, and he figured it out. I was in the same position. I figured it out. Like, I'm not going to go to New York and get signed. I'm not going down to L.A. and asking Motown to sign me. They don't have any uh, rappers on their label. You know what I'm saying? It was It was like, it was a dream that didn't seem attainable, so independence was the only way. And as soon as we went independent, the music was already popular from what we were doing in the streets. As soon as we made a, le a legitimate independent music hustle with our own self-owned companies, it just made a lot of money immediately. And that 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 set off a sort of an arrogance in the Bay because you're looking at your hometown guys and they're doing really big things and they're doing it on their own terms. And that that means... And now everybody goes, I saw I saw 40's formula. I saw Two Shorts formula. I'm about to do the same shit. I'm going to go to the same guys they put this shit through, and then I'm going to get my value up. And then when the majors come at me, they're going to have to pay me big. You know what I mean? So in a lot of our cases, when we um, by the time we got dis discovered by the mainstream, we were always making a lot of money. We were, you know, you, you go in there and yeah. you, you, you're making $5 for every cassette tape you sell back in the day, and you got thousands on top of thousands on top of thousands of people purchasing us and that money goes straight to you once you get into the system right. you know if you got to go around with your demo asking people to sign you you're gonna get like a, a real low-end kind of acceptance a, a, a not so good deal but if you go in there and you already the master of your profession and you you know, selling units and you're like bro I don't really need the money you offer me what you offering you get a better deal you know so that's what we gave. The, we gave the game. We gave it the independent hustle so from the, the Bay. So the independent hustle came from the Bay. And it still lives and to this day. you gave the game to others. They saw how you did it and they replicated it. So not only is it, I would say, just outside looking in, you also, which is still so odd for me to even say, especially my, my power to the woman ass, right? You also made it okay for whatever reason to use the word bitch. Now, is it because it's there is a, a lyric to it? You know what I mean? It's 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 melodic. You know what the? How is that okay? Because even and I'm love NWA, love Ice Cube. Even when they did it, it was disrespectful. There, it wasn't so disrespectful for when you said it. 
of the conversations yes. that we had personally, just we the, have. the few, and we've sat around and talked. Um, I did not bring that word into my music in a disrespectful tone. So I can say a very disrespectful line. You can write it down on a piece of paper. Bitch, suck my dick. But the way I said it in the music, it makes it a little more, That's what you it know, was. either it's funny, because if you say it on the right punchline, <laughs> it makes you laugh. Or it might it could be sort of enticing. Because and you, under, you gotta understand also, this is from I'm I'm mimicking and and like turning entertainment into something that I got from really real life pimp culture. And in pimp culture, these words are not, they don't mean the same thing. There's a totally different meaning. In pimp culture, bitch means baby. Like my love. It's, it's like the same, that's that's what it means. It's like a term of endearment. And I'm mimicking this and I'm making, you know, a lot of, the humor is what made it go by. And I also put it in, I didn't put it, it didn't come from me to you. I always go listen to the two short songs. I'm always talking to the listener and we're talking about her. And that makes it easier to digest is that right when you hear, you go, yeah, he's, this, he's definitely talking about her, not me. So I give you that option to, to either play the role or to deflect it and go, I'm feeling what he's saying because <laughs> they are like that. She is okay. like that, you know, and it works. So you either laugh it off, you deflect it, and then somewhere along the line, I don't think I get credit for this. I think popular culture and, you know, just culture in general. I don't want to put in any word before it, but women... When they started going, let's go, bitch. We're my bitches, you know? And they're like, and you walk up and be like, who's that? That's my bitch. Like, and it's the way the tone. None of those were disrespectful. And yeah. women took the word that probably the reason why it naturally happened is because it came yeah. from misogynist hip hop. And women listened to the music, loved the music, didn't really set well with them. And they said, just like the word nigga, we own this word now. Only mm -hmm. time you can call me this word is when I say you can. And when, I, when mm -hmm. it's not authorized, you're mm -hmm. going to feel the wrath. And it went there. And Why don't you give yourself credit? It just credit flipped for that. it, you know. And um, and a lot of white people, because I think, but and when you talk about the masses and what the music was doing, it was hip hop really took to misogyny. And I think that um. You, you, the backlash is happening right now. The female Every rappers. day, all day. I can't. I turn it up louder, Meg. Go heart, go Cardi, go. Like Jasmine Sullivan, even even the rappers. It's in soul. And it's just, and it's just, it's just that was the evolution. It just had to, it had to happen. You can't, you can't keep hip hop out that long. You can't keep females out that long. You can't, you know what I'm saying? Hip hop had a policy that said. Mm -hmm. One female at a time. Trina, goes on the Nikki, and then they all come in and they're like, yeah. comes off the pedestal. Yeah, once, Correct. Once she's off the pedestal, another one goes up. Never can. Mm -hmm. And they're like, two, no, the thank you. Crying. All of us can thrive. All of us can win. And, it, and during this entire time, we've been yes. having MC Lights. We've been You're having right. Lauren Hills. We've been having Queen Lights. We've been having Bart. It, it was, it was, it was a... You know, it was a, a same struggle but in society. I will say, but now it's I will all, say all that's even done. the type of music where these women are are the what what I was referring to. And I don't know if you're saying that too. Yes, these female rappers are getting after it, but they're talking just as reckless as y'all talked at one point in time, and it's with intention. And and maybe it started with Little Kim, maybe before then, right? But my point is, is that it's very much this empowering anthem that takes away. Um, the the stigma that says you can call me a hoe, the stigma that says you that I I'm a hoe if I decide to get it how I live, right? Or or yes, the word bitch used incessantly in a very endearing way. Um, I still credit you with that. But I am watching I, I I'm watching these women, <laughs> and I'm all like, oh she she's like I want this money, you better give it to me. If you ain't got no money, I ain't trying to hear you. Like back in the day. 
That's unheard of. You're not allowed to say that because you can't be a gold digger. So everything that we've been listening to with male hip hop and all of the derogatory terms, these women are like, no, nah, that's right. I'm all of those things. It's my bread. I mean, some, some, dope, some dope female rapper stood at the table one too many times listening to a song that said, <laughs> it ain't that's tricky right. if you got it. Uh, it you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to buy you this, bitch, you're going to do this for me. And she was like, yeah. you know what, <laughs> We gonna do this shit on my terms. We are gonna buy it, but not on that little shit you said. This this is how it goes. And um, Nicki Minaj. You know, Nick, Nicki but Minaj. I, I give it to Little you know, Kim. She, Kim little, I feel like Little Kim was doing it before, very inappropriately, and we were like, oh, "How dare you!" And then you're like, "She's she's, she's the trailblazer, Heck pioneer." Yeah. Little Kim, Foxy Brown, they blazed that trail of, of um, you know. When we do let a female on, she's got to be sort of regal and she has to be No, I'm good. I'm out here getting it. And they was like, um, I love that. I love that you even said that. I want to go back because you said something and I want to, by education, because this is for educational purposes only. Bitch comes from pimp, mm-hmm. the pimp culture, the pimp life. My friend was here a moment ago and she immediately identified you as pimp daddy, right? Knowing... I know, but she was just like, he's a true OG (laughs) pimp. Like, she says that to me all the time. Like, she was like, he's our OG pimp. Whatever that, not in, not in the way that you are. You know what I'm saying? So, tell me about that. It's from Oakland. Tell me about what that means. Um, so, Oakland was a city at one time that was like the vice, where you go for your vices. In the Bay, the Bay Area has millions of people and there are places you go, but then Oakland was that city that people knew, like you go there to party. We had clubs that were like fun. Uh, and you know, we had right next door to us is the, is the Alameda Navy Naval Base. That was right mm-hmm. next door to Oakland. Alameda is the city next door to Oakland. We had the Oakland Army Base, which was like West Oakland. It's in, in Oakland. It was. And then right up the street, we had the Travis Air Force Base. So you got all these military guys. You got all these um, people from around the city and the suburbs that need to go somewhere to get their vices on, which um, I don't think I need to name the vices, but it's the things you do when you go out and party and you know, then you go back to where you're from and act like you didn't do it. You know, people would come to Oakland to get that thing. And this is a story that was told to me about of somebody older than me. So you hear you have this demand and you have poverty and you have underprivileged. And then it just becomes, you know, the pimp culture is a thing that thrived in many cities. And it was a when you think about it, you try to picture cars with too many accessories. Mm-hmm. Dudes with suits that match the shoes, mm-hmm. and every time they talk, they, the words rhyme. Mm-hmm. That was an image that was portrayed, but in reality, all you had to do was provide the service. And it wasn't just the vices I talk about; it was not just women. It was mm-hmm. anything else you might want to get to have to party and have fun. So, a lot of dudes in Oakland, like it was, if you're my age, I come out of high school in 1984. If you're my age. I'm in high school in the early 80s, and I see this. Anything you've seen in a movie, and you looking back and going, remember them old pimps? Look at I saw that on the streets. And before crack cocaine came into the neighborhoods. You can. And I, if I can talk like this, a pimp, pimp and a prostitute were very much respected as they looked and what they drove and how they stepped out. And they didn't. It wasn't like, oh, she's some crack hole, she's dirty. No, it was like, I'm wearing the best clothes and I look good. And it was like a fashion show. And because of all the things I named to you before, it thrived in our area. It thrived. There was a, a big demand. The entire Bay is coming to you for these vices. And, and then in the culture. So then you get the guys who they're really good at it. They're really good at the imaging of it and the marketing of it and the, the card and matches and the... You know, it's just whatever, all the way down to the what the girls are wearing and 
and and the, the, the little things they do just to make it like you know it, it's a show. It's entertainment. Outside of the actual work, 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 it's entertainment. And I just took to that. I'm a little kid. I'm like, I'm out on the streets. We used to go down to watch the show. Like you're going to play at the park. We're going down to San Pablo and we're going to kick back and watch. We like, we can't get into action because we're not the guys. And the right. girls, they're like, get out of here, yeah. little boy. Like, get, get on up out of here. But we out there just like watching. And I decided when I started writing music, it just hit me one day. I, I'll tell you what happened. I heard the song, The Message, Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, The Message. And The Message gave me a visual of what was going on in New York. Mm. I could see New York and I wasn't even there. The song, if you listen to it right now, you can picture the story. And I, I, I said right then, and the first time I heard the song, I said, I'm going to tell the story mm. of Oakland. And that's when I started doing it. And I just started looking at the streets and looking at the people and listening to what they say. And I put it all in songs. And, you know, I tried to balance out what I did. Okay, you're saying these things that are very negative in certain songs. Well, let's do like two or three songs to counter that that are very positive. And let's, let's kind of always have a balance. People don't even know this. Probably like the first four major label albums that I did. When you put the album on, I don't curse. I don't say one curse word until maybe like 30 minutes into the each album. The reason that was is because back then it was cassettes. And uh, Born and Mag, Life is Too Short, Short Dogs in the House, Shorty the Pimp, all these albums were designed so that if you play side A, it's clean. If you flip it over and play side B, it comes. it becomes extremely explicit. And I've saved many a kid from getting the ass whooping with that because the kids from back in the day were like, my grandma would pop in the room and say, what you listening to? And I just yeah. put the and say, it's too short. And it's just like, and look, I, thought I, heard, I thought I heard some yeah, cussing. And like, back in the day, uh, cursing was unheard of. Now, if you're not cursing, it seems, it seems bizarre and odd. But, and, I was like, and, I'm, and I just, I figured if I'm going to bring light to this pimp culture and my image is going to be a pimp. I have to like personally, I have to personally save myself and out for conversations like this for when I'm with my auntie and my mother and they, mm -hmm. they saying, the hell is you saying on that song? And then I kind of, I have, I'm like, well, I listen to this song, the ghetto auntie. I ain't just make Was that tail. with intention, though? Go, oh, yeah, okay, when okay, you okay. did it, you said you purposely did it, but the intention behind it, rather, is probably the question, was so that you appealed to a broader audience, so that you didn't seem disrespectful to women, so that people knew your versatility. What was the intent? Way more simple than that. It was because I was reporting Oakland to you, and all of that is Oakland. Mm -hmm. Oakland ain't just a pimp and a hoe. Oakland is... Oakland is every song Too Short ever wrote. Listen to it. That's what that's what the spectrum is. I'm looking at the city like an artist. If an artist whose visual is feeding off a city, you're going to keep seeing that city in that art. Well, as a musical artist, I was feeding off the city. And you, the music, I, I, I feel like I'm a fan of Too Short because I know where the songs came from. Like, I really know that I would be sitting in a room playing dominoes with the homies and I'm going, doo, 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 doo. I'm kind of recording because they say the funniest shit and the slickest shit and the craziest stories. And when I leave there, I'm probably going to have something in my head. That's the, the, the foundation of a song. Cause they, cause we laugh so much and it's just real life. Somebody come in and tell you a story about what they just saw down the street. And I'm like, that is a song that really happened. Like, and so many of my songs are, stories I heard in Oakland or things I saw in Oakland or things I just thought of thinking like what would be an Oakland scenario. And I just used it. I, Oakland has been like my muse for music. Like when I lived in Atlanta, I was in Atlanta, mm. based in Atlanta for almost 15 years. The entire time I was in Atlanta, it was so easy for me to write songs because in my mind, I have all this Oakland that I can re refer to. And I'm just thinking, you know, and I go at the time I was traveling back, back and forth a lot. 
But it was just easy because I got yeah. a pen and paper in my hand and I got nothing to say. I just think about Oakland. I could tell you um, a, a true story. It's kind of personal, but it's true. And I was um, in the studio with Notorious B.I.G. And we were making a song called um, The World is Filled with Pimps and Hoes. And on that song, Puffy comes on first. And then the hook comes is Carl Thomas. Biggie comes on. And then Carl Thomas back. And now it's my turn. Now we're at the studio. Carl Thomas has already done his part. The hook was already on there. Puffy was bringing us to the session to finish the song. That night, me and Big were going to record our vocals. Puffy's verse is already on there. So he's the first verse. He pushed play. Now it's two blank verses. Biggie goes in the studio, and like that, Hmm. he lays a verse that's like classic. Now everybody's laughing, smoking. And they look over at me. What you going to do? I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I can't. (laughs) Biggie didn't write his verse. He just sat around while everybody was laughing and shit. Wow. And went in there and said, I'm ready. And he just goes in there and raps his verse. No pen, no paper. Some shit that him and Jay-Z and they, you know, they they got all, all the rappers with the no pen. They started that no pen shit. So I'm sitting there with a pen and paper that I haven't written one word on. And I'm like, damn. Like, I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm in New York. My back's up against the wall, it's pressure. So I got one person with me, my homie from Oakland, my homie P. One person's with me. And I, I, I go confide in him and I'm like, damn, dude, he just murdered that shit. P. Like, I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck am I gonna do? Like, what? He said, listen to the song. The song says, the world is filled with pimps and hoes. Mm. I'll just tell you about those I know. That's what the hook says. P said, neither one of them rapped about a pimp or a hoe. Just do what the song says do. I wrote the verse so fast after that. I'm like, shit, all I got to do is tell you a story <laughs> about a pimp and a hoe that I know. Oakland. And it just and I just easily just stepped into it and there's a little bit of truth to the story I'm telling. There's a little bit of truth to the stuff I'm talking at the end. And I got it from Oakland. And, and the reason why I said it's a personal story, because oh, there's really? some people in that story that got mad at me. It's like, what the wow. fuck you put my... It's like, yeah, it's a true story. I would story. say, as we have this conversation... Say it again? I didn't say names. Oh, of course not. Yeah, of course not. I didn't name anybody's name, so that's why they were... Okay. Clear, kind of as we have this conversation... Um, I feel like you're giving us, and and this is one thing I do love about the people from the Bay. You're giving us um, an anthology, if you will, of, of hip hop from Oakland, from the town, from from the Bay Area. I'm giving you a much smaller word than anthology. I'm in giving short. you the game. In short, in too short. Um, <laughs> you get game. You got to hit me with your big words. words. I know you went to school, Carrie. <laughs> Don't might give a damn about your big ass words. Game, Mary, game. Take your big words and get out of here. Um, <laughs> but it, it is that. And it's fascinating to me. And so I would want to, I want you to describe Northern California hip hop versus South Southern California hip hop. But for that matter, gangster rap versus what you did. Like there is growing up here, there's a significant okay. difference. I think. Okay. Yeah, it's um <clears throat> every city has its heartbeat in the rap music that comes from there. The hip hop that comes from Chicago has a very Chicago vibe, as does Detroit, as does Houston, as does Miami, as does Atlanta. And a lot of people outside of California listen to songs that come from Southern California rappers and songs that come from Northern California rappers, and they say, that's West Coast. And I say to them, that's an L.A. song. Yeah. And they say, what the fuck does that mean? And I'm like, it's different than a bass song. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. West Coast is West Coast. And I'm like, well, if you're from there, you kind of know that it's different. So for one, people from outside of 
our side of the world, they don't get the the gist of you can get in a car and go from New York to Washington, D.C. faster than you can from L.A. to Oakland. And they don't understand that going in that car from New York to D.C., you just went through how many Philly. cities? Philly. Yeah, probably oh, depending. Yeah, you're right. You went through several. Uh, Jersey. I don't know. Go on. <laughs> So I'm saying you 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 hit a lot of little baby cultures before you get there. And that's like that's how far apart we are. And I don't think they Yeah, and, and it's um we're like um we like uh, like a big like brother, distant, little brother. I was gonna say like distant cousins, cousins but related. We're I don't related. know, but you're right. I don't but if but it's different. I've seen people from LA, I've seen people from LA touch their foot on the ground in Oakland, California for the first time and go, Correct. where am I? Correct. Is, Correct. Am I in California? Like, where am I? Like, it's, it is a culture shock that I, is that much different. And then, you know, looks wise, the water and the bridges and then the hairstyles, you know, LA, LA women are like, what you Bay Area <laughs> girls doing with y'all hair? Come on now. No, no. This is. uh, No, I was gonna say. I was gonna say the women that I know from the Bay all have their own hair. They're very natural. They're very laid back, or that's their their appearance in which they choose to give. They bad bad, but they just give a very. LA's a bit more, you know, a little more sceny, but. But when I listen, I clearly know the difference because I grew up in Southern California. But if I'm listening, I'm hearing gangster rap versus another type of story that you just talked about. I'm just giving you the history of where I'm from. There's a pride. Yeah, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of blue and red in there. The blue and red, you know, references of um, neighborhoods and gangs. There's a certain little beat. Um, I don't necessarily want to just say the G-Funk and just say it's Death Row and Dr. Dre or anything like that. But there's a certain beat, right? Because you can right. hear like in some Ice T songs and a lot of, a lot, of, a lot of um, Southern California rappers like King T. It was a lot of mm-hmm. people that did that sound. DJ Quick, and and you know, <clears throat> I love the evolution of LA rap because you, if you know certain little references, there's a lot of references in there. If they don't some sometimes boldly say, and it's um, it's a hidden language that even a lot of people listen to the music and memorize the words and still don't know the true meaning of what they're saying to each other and what they're talking about when little little references uh, that are only like gang related, uh, like Dayton's, like remember related. everybody don't know and, what Dayton's <clears throat> are. They don't know their type of rim that when NWA would always be like cruising down the street in my six four, right? It's like I feel like that's a LA thing with like rims. I know that you might have had that there, but it felt very that beat that that familiar like going down Crenshaw like on a Sunday and there was car club. Look at this. All the three wheel motion, all that and talking about the low riders in hip hop. LA rappers put mm-hmm. the low riders in the videos from day one. And they represented the low riders from day one. In the Bay, low riders mm-hmm. with hydraulics is Mexican culture. It's not it's not black culture. And even though some of us have ventured over and dabbled, it's really not, it doesn't really mix. Like we we meet up the up up north, like when we go to a car show or something, the Mexicans with the low riders. The black dudes will be having like high performance and so like different kind of old schools. Same old school love, but just fix them up different. We meet up because we all go for the the booming sound system, and it's all it's the same. But we're not really into like hydraulics and stuff. And then as as Northern California rappers, we respect that, but you don't see um a lot no, of no no it's di- it like, totally it's, 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 no that's 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 a that's difference a um. Oh. I mean, the slang. The, the slang, slang is, is like tremendous. It's worlds apart. Like we, just, we use different words. We and we use different words, and we um, and we uh, it's different. I don't know. It's just different. It's different, and and it, it's so different that as soon as you hear a song, I, to this day, so you know us older cats, we don't really instantly identify 
everything new in hip hop. It's not like instant. Oh, oh yeah, that's a so and so. You know, so I'm not even really trying to most of the time. I wasn't even really trying to do that back in the day. I just listen to music. If I like it, I like it. I don't, I don't. But I can still to this day listen, and I'm listening. I'm like my DJ. Um, he's really like into everything. So he's like, he got the files on everything. He got everybody, he know every song. So he'd be playing some shit. We riding in the car, you know, out on the road doing shows or something. And I'm like, uh, listen, I'm like, I'm like, where homie from? You from LA? He's like, yep. I'm like, I can hear it. And I'm like, uh, then another song, come on. I'm like, who's that? A new little homie? Like, yeah, he knew. I'm like, where are you from the bay? Where are you at from the bay? I can hear everything he's saying. A certain way he talks and the certain lingo he uses is from the bay. And then the production, the way the beat sounds. We crossed the line and kind of bite each other's styles from time to yeah, time. Oh, one hundred percent. If you pay, it. like, you, if, if people yeah. really gave it a chance, you could tell. So, I think even on site, you use the the female reference, I, the guy reference. I could tell a dude from the Bay versus a dude from LA, like right away. You how we move, how we talk, how we think, um, what we think is important. You know what I mean? A area male rappers are are um, stuck on reminding you that we are not going to trick on you. They got so many ways to refer to. I ain't tricking. I ain't tricking. That like, we love to say we're not tricking. Um, L.A. rappers always slip that little gang culture in. There. They always throw a little reference. Oh good. Oh, good. <laughs> like you wouldn't even know what. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't know what that means if you're not from I, the culture. Okay, so I asked you this because there was a debate happening. Now I want to get your opinion on it. Was someone left out in the Super Bowl? In the Super Bowl performance, the Ode to Hip Hop, which I thought really felt very South Central, very gangster rapish to me, right? Uh, Dr. Dre's affiliates that really did good. The game had an album that sold 5 million copies, the first one, but you know, game. He like to step on toes a lot, so I don't know. I don't know where him and Dre are in the love. Do you and, think and, he? You know, love do you think fan. he should have been there? Because that's where I was going. The conversation is: Where's the game? He should have at least had one. No. Uh, well, you said if somebody wasn't there, who was it? I, would, I said the game because he had a five times platinum album that Dr. Dre produced. But I think that maybe Dre was just going on. I don't know relationships. I don't know, man. I don't. I don't know where I mean, they stand. It, so yeah, no, and I don't want to get into relationships. That that's that. I, but what did you? I mean, he could have had a little moment with um. That's what I'm saying. Did you feel like, like the dog pound or the right? I was like, Correct. I'm saying, wait, did we miss the dog pound? Was Daz and Corrupt supposed to be there? Do we want, did we think the game should have been there? Is there another, is there somebody else who was quintessential to this hip hop game that Dre has affiliations with that should have actually been there to represent LA? The most that I hear consistently is dog pound and the game. Consistently. Yeah, but he, um, he could have, I mean, Dre has so many classics. He could have did a whole halftime concert that was 15, 20, 30 minutes. And we would have loved it, you know? So I think he dealt with it the way, with how much time he got. It was perfect. Um, The next tier of guys that didn't make it, it just, I mean, just look who you didn't make the cut with, you know, 50, Mm -hmm. you know? No, the game game went on... um, I Am Athlete and said, which is another podcast that Brandon Marshall, former NFL player, has... And said he, he felt left out and, and it hurt his feelings. But you're right. Like, who he, Dre, you know, he's at the top. He's on Mount Rushmore. So he had so many. Like, you do have to make, I'm sure that was the conversation. Who who won't make it, but who needs to be in there? I was thinking I mean, that too. Out, I was thinking that too. That would have been cool. I mean, keep it a buck. I mean, you want to start saying. I mean, why are you keeping it? Left, and left I, I, I was like, well, out. is it, in my mind, I was like, well, is it just Southern California? Just, but I'm like, no, because Eminem was there, right? 50 was there. So I'm all like, I don't understand. So, you know, me, me, Snoop, so Ice it makes Cube it, and E-40 have a group right? called Mount Westmore. Me, Ice Cube, and E-40 all said to Snoop, uh, I, why you ain't bringing Ice Mount Westmore Cube, to Snoop? Right? And I know their, their beef is legendary, but they're still the same, right? 
Ice Cube and Dre are homies. They so made, then, made why wasn't he there? Called Straight out of Compton, they're homies. I'm just saying, it was the the, the what he put together was a dope show. What he could have did was, it could have been. A, a I enjoyed more, it, you know, but I just had to ask you that question. I want to get your take on it. Now that's the that's the shit, right? It's like a top five. When you create a top five, you always got to leave somebody out. That's in sports in our world. If you want to start an argument, you do the generic conversation of give me your top five. Yeah, because um why? There ain't no such thing. Because when you start going make me a list, you've got to account for a lot of of okay. um okay. variables that could have, okay. would have, shoulda. And Okay. From year to year, era to era, region to region, rules, regulations. It's just too many things to factor in. And then you can't tell me that um you know, like um like Rolling Stone keeps doing these long ass lists of like best albums, right. best I'm like, who the fuck is the judge? Like that's the that's always that's always the question to where does fucking list come from? Because this ain't my list. It's not my list. So and they make you mad because you're right. You don't count. People. You're like, well, what do you mean? When we say top five, or even if we say LeBron versus MJ, right? Somebody will be like, but what about this? And he had that. And it's, they played differently. Or they did this differently. Or he only had this many chips. That's the answer. The answer is, how many chips do you have? That determines who's the GOAT. And I agree with you. Like, you can't, you can't, everyone's, <laughs> everyone's, is that, that list will be subjective. So with that being said, I'm going to start how I began this. I'm going to, I'm going to pick up where I began this conversation and talking about the evolution of one too short. You have eighties, nineties, two thousands, two tens, two twenties, still thriving, still moving. And I had, and I asked E40 this too. What is it? You talk about the industry evolving and understanding, but as are you, why, why are they just now, not even just, but if we look, Look at you performing uh, at Golden State Warriors game. Why is it just now, right? I think um, in the case of me and 40 and even, you know, guys like Snoop Snoop and and Cube, we're icons now. We're no longer recording artists. And no matter how many shows we do or how many future albums we put out, icon status is locked in. It's locked in. And when you take your icons and you talk about, I mean, we can go down the list of athletes and entertainers who we gave icon status. You're in. Your latest hit no longer matters. You're my guy forever. And a lot of them don't do iconic things after they receive icon status. Like you get your status and that's your body of work. That's it. That's how many home runs you hit. That's how many ch- chips you won. That's how many fights you won. That's how many you're an icon. But we're the kind of icons who keep building on, keep going, keep going. I'm still doing shows. I'm still recording. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm not in the house sitting on a porch in a rocking chair telling stories about my first tour. Not doing that. So I think, you know, guys like us, <laughs> Ice Cube is rich. He's in the studio with the songs, going on tour. Like, you ain't got to right. go on tour. He's doing it because he loves it. Like, literally, Ice Cube says, I'm having fun. We're in the middle of a show on stage, crowd out there. He's like, this is fun. So I'm just saying, to be that age, to be that age and to... And to um mm-hmm. to feel that way about your yeah. craft. You know what I mean? Like you got some guys in basketball that if they weren't coaching, they would be like miserable. Because they want to be a part of the game. I've heard guys say, just being uh, commentators, like, man, I just want to be in the building. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't want to be away from the game. That put that same phrase in too short, the same word. I want to be in the building. I want to be around the game. Put that in too short. Put it in Oakland, California. Put it in the pimp shit. <laughs> I just want to be in the building. You know, I want to be around the game. You know, it's the same thing. 
I ain't nothing but For a Hall sure. of Fame NBA Ballers player. Ballers want to be rappers, no. rappers want to be ballers. It's very <laughs> equivalent, right? The, the the business is very much the same in that way. Um, if, I, if I was an NBA player and I ended up being a head coach, this is where I'm at now. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to get out there, practice with, with my guys, and still shoot some hoops. And what you know NBA what I mean? player is the good. equivalent of too short? Uh, anybody who played those, uh, you know, LeBron seasons, man, those seasons. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a LeBron type, you know, because he's like a, um, yeah, he's like a, um, a hybrid human oh, for sure. And we probably gonna find out in the future that he was the first <laughs> for sure. prototype half for sure. human, half robot. Like he for just sure. didn't tell us, want to show us how real it was. But um, give me a name. Uh. Who's had the career that you've had? Who who reminds you of you in terms of what you've been able to accomplish and what they've been able to accomplish, playing or retired? Mm. I, would, I would say like a Vince Carter. Like you never have to be, you don't got to be MJ, but every time you do it, they go, ooh. And every time you fucking hang in that rim with that <laughs> elbow, you look down at everybody and say, bitch. Like, you know what I'm saying? And you don't have to ever ever walk in a room and tell people what you did because they already know. other people are going to talk and about they already you. know. That part. Ever. That part. You, I've never you seen Vince Carter brag. He don't I need brag to. on him. <laughs> you do. <laughs> he don't have to. Yeah, so that's, that's my kind 20. of guy. How many seasons did he do? 19, 20 what? That's like... 20, okay, and, yeah. and that's what I'm saying. Could have still played again. Could have continued to play. He was like, it's just time. I'm going to do some TV now. I love that. Yeah, so that's my what kind do you of guy, have yeah. uh, going? I know you mentioned Mount Westmore. We know that's an iconic group. They can check you guys out. E40 talked about it. I love the idea of y'all out there still being like, it's fun. We getting it. What about music for you? What are you working on? Well, the quarantine was a beautiful thing in terms of uh, recording music. I recorded not only two Mount Westmore mm-hmm. albums, I also recorded two solo albums. And as we speak, my guys in the room, two rooms mm-hmm. over in the studio, mastering album number two. Album number one is already ready and about to be released. I'm going to drop the two albums really fast because I don't have this grand plan of spreading them out and doing I'm just, it's like a now thing. Mount Westmore is coming out. I'm going to drop a couple albums. E-40 is going to drop some stuff. And we just, <clears throat> we're just making that statement like hip hop. Who said I can't? Who told me I can't? You know what I'm saying? Like I'm walking out in front of like, sold out arenas and I'm thinking to myself mm. I did this when I was 20 I was 20 years old like 36 years ago and I was doing the same thing when I was 14 years old I was on a microphone rapping next to the DJ trying to rock the crowd I'm still doing the same thing I'm rapping on stage the DJ's right there the same thing 40 years later so I'm out there looking at the crowd going <laughs> This is a blessing. Like this is, I'm, I'm like, I had enough of this a long time ago. I had, I had my more than my share, and you're gonna give me more. I'm like, just wow, wow. The music sounds good. Um, I refuse to make um, music that doesn't sound good, even though hip hop does have its, um, it does have its ageism. The older rappers don't want to give respect to the younger rappers. But at the same time, the industry, the mainstream hip hop mm-hmm. industry doesn't want to give any play to older artists. So so that hate is all over the place in the ages. Sure it's, every cool. business. It's, it's, it's all right with me because when your icon status, it doesn't matter what your last hit was. The, the, the phone never stops ringing. Um, you've looking with the videos that have been going viral lately. Uh, the, the OG frat dudes dancing, the, stepping the two short below the whistle, you know what I'm saying? And the shit go viral. It's like, it's like it's um, solidified. 